Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Those wonderful words from the book of the prophet Joel. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. If I were to give a title or a theme to this sermon, then probably just two words would be adequate. Spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership. Not just the kind of leadership that you see up front or way ahead or at the top of the tree, but also the kind of spiritual leadership that is grassroots and humble and leads by example. And when you hear the words spiritual leadership, what do you think of? Or probably more accurately, who do you think of? Desmond Tutu? Nelson Mandela? Mother Teresa? Oscar Romero? Martin Luther King Jr.? Maya Angelou, the Dalai Lama, Mahatma Gandhi, St. Francis of Assisi, Andrew Carnegie, or perhaps the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, perhaps even the moderator of the General Assembly. I'm hoping that thus far no one has revolted at any of these names, because it's true, isn't it, that something about each of these people and their story resonates with us in a deep way, and that their life, their beliefs and their values, how they treat other people, sets the kind of tone or example we would want to hear and see. None of them, of course, is perfect, but their contribution far outweighs their faults. Let me tell you a fictitious story. There was a very lost, wicked, and rebellious man who decided that it would be good for his local business if he went down to the local church and joined it. This man was an adulterer, an alcoholic, and had never been a member of a church in his life. But when he went down to the church, he gave public testimony to the congregation that there was no sin in his life, and that he had grown up in the church. And therefore, as you can imagine, they readily accepted him as a member. When he went home, he told his wife what he had done, and his wife, a very godly lady normally, exploded. She criticized him for being criticized him for being such a hypocrite and demanded that he go back to church the next week and confess what he was really like. Some say that God used his wife to really break him, and he took it to heart. The next Sunday, he went back to the church, walked down to the front again, and this time confessed to the congregation all of his sins. He told them he was dishonest, an alcoholic, an adulterer, and that he was sorry. The church revoked his membership on the spot. And he walked out of the church that day, scratching his head and muttering to himself, these church folk are really strange. I told a lie, and they took me in. 
And when I told the truth, they kicked me out. Jesus told a story of two men in a similar situation who had totally different results. One man tried to talk himself into God's kingdom, but he didn't make it. And one man tried to talk himself out of God's kingdom, and he did make it. Now, St. Luke makes it very clear who Jesus told this parable to. For he says in verse 9, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, dear friends, if you want to know whether or not you are being addressed in this parable, let me ask some questions. Do you ever look at people who don't go to church and think that you are better than they are because you do? If so, Jesus is talking to you in this parable. Or do you ever look at people, say, in prison and think that you are better than they are because you are not? If so, Jesus is talking to you in this parable? Or do you ever look at people who are divorced and think that you are better than they are because you are not? If so, Jesus is talking to you in this parable. Or do you ever look down your nose at anyone for any reason and think you might be better than them And if so, Jesus is talking to you and to me in this parable. I promise you every one of us will find ourselves somewhere in this story. Because at one time or another, all of us are guilty of trying to impress God or others without truly realizing what actually impresses God and what doesn't. The Pharisee fooled himself. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now I know that immediately most of us are probably ready to criticize the Pharisee because he is, to say the very least, a little bit arrogant. But actually, let's give him some credit because quite frankly, he was really committed to his job. He dotted every religious I and he crossed every theological T. He went strictly by the book and he had a heart for religion. The problem was his religion had no heart. But in this story, here he is standing in the center of the inner court right in the heart of the temple. And the reason he stood there is because it was there where he could best be heard and best be seen. He lets everybody know just how wonderful he is. First of all, we read that he fasts twice a week. But the Old Testament only required a Jew to fast once per year on the Day of Atonement. But this man fasted 103 times more than he was required in a year. And then we read that he tithed everything that he possessed. And again, the Old Testament only required that you tithe your income. But this man tithed everything that he earned 
and everything that he bought. In other words, he was a double tither. Now, there's nothing wrong with fasting, and there's nothing wrong with tithing. But the problem in this story is that the man thought that when a lot of people, the man thought what a lot of people think today. He thought that his goodness gained him brownie points with God. He thought that God accepts a person based on what they do for him. And this is what the Pharisee thought would impress God. But we know what impresses God. What impresses God is when you don't try to impress God. The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis once said, A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you can't see what's above you. And so the other person in the parable in the story, of course, is the man who faulted himself. A tax collector was as different from a Pharisee as night is from day. Tax collectors were the dirt of Jewish society. They charged exorbitant rates. They skimmed extra money off the top. And they would steal sweeties from babies or as we would sometimes say in Scotland, they would even sell their own granny. They were considered traitors to Israel. They were so despised that they could not hold public office or even give testimony in Jewish court because their word was considered worthless. The tax collector was to the Pharisee what an offender is to the police. But this is where the story takes a strange twist. The Pharisee tried to impress God, but he couldn't. The tax collector did impress without even trying, because now we see what really impresses God. Humility being humble. You can actually hear it in the tax collector's voice, for he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God heard his prayer, for Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The tax collector knew his faults, and was humble enough to confess them. Let me finish with a wonderful story that some of you may have heard. Many years ago, a man conned his way into the orchestra of the Emperor of China, although he could not play a single note. Whenever the group practiced or performed, he would hold the flute against his lips, pretending to play, but not making a sound. For years, he received a good salary and enjoyed a comfortable living. Then one day, the emperor requested a solo from each musician. Well, as you can imagine, the flautist got very nervous. There wasn't enough time to learn the instrument. He pretended to be sick, but the royal physician wasn't fooled. On the day of his solo performance, the imposter took poison and killed himself. The explanation of his suicide led to a phrase that has found its way into the English language. He refused to face the music. Dear friends, the way to impress God is simply to face the music, to be honest and humble and helpful to others. So, 
Let's face the music and dance. Amen. <laughs>